Shall we bow our heads for prayer? Father in heaven, we thank you so much for this beautiful day that you have given us. We're thankful that in spite of the sin in this world, there still is so much beauty to thank you for. We just ask that as we open your holy word and we study about the Tower of Babel and end time Babylon, that your Holy Spirit will be with us and help us to understand how from antiquity you were preparing to bring the seed into the world to bless all nations. We thank you, Lord, for hearing our prayer, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. We'd like to begin our study today in the book of Genesis, chapter 9 and verse 1. Genesis chapter 9 and verse 1. This verse is describing God's plan for Noah and his family and their descendants after the flood. And we find the following words. So God blessed Noah and his sons and said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. You notice that God's plan after the flood was that humanity should scatter abroad over all of the earth and fill the earth. Now the Tower of Babel episode took place approximately 100 years after the flood. And as we read Genesis chapter 11 we discover that human beings did exactly the opposite of what God had told them to do. Instead of scattering abroad over all of the earth, they conglomerated together, they consolidated together in one place. Let's go in our Bibles to Genesis chapter 11 and verses 1 and 2. Genesis chapter 11 and verses 1 and 2. It says, Now the whole earth was one language and one speech. And it came to pass as they journeyed from the east, actually a better translation is as they journeyed toward the east. Because if you look at the geography, you'll discover that Mount Ararat is in Turkey. And uh, Babylon, where the Tower of Babel was built, is actually southeast from Turkey. And so a better translation, as many modern versions have it, is that they traveled towards the east. It says that they found a plain in the land of Shinar and they dwelt there. Now undoubtedly the reason why they decided to dwell there was because Ararat is a place where there are many mountains, the land is not so fertile. Therefore they looked for more fertile ground. It's interesting to notice that Genesis 11 begins by saying that they all spoke the same language. Now, if you look at the world today, you'll discover that people who speak the same language tend to band together. Uh, language unites people in a national unity. It's much more natural to unite people who speak the same language and the same dialect. We're going to find in this story, however, that the devil had a very special plan in mind taking into account that there was one language and one speech. And that is that the devil, instead of wanting them to spread abroad over the earth, he wanted them to consolidate together in one place because when you have this type of consolidation, apostasy is much easier when people band together. And of course, ultimately, the devil's purpose was to demoralize the human race, to totally corrupt the human race shortly after the flood, as he had tried to do before the flood, in order to make the holy line from which the Messiah would come disappear from human history. The whole Tower of Babel episode needs to be understood in the light of Genesis 3.15. The devil in this story is trying to consolidate humanity in open rebellion against God to destroy the holy line, to totally corrupt and demoralize the world so that the promised Messiah who would crush the serpent's head would not be able to come. 
Now it's interesting to notice who the builder of the city and the tower of Babel was. If we go back to Genesis chapter 10 and verses 8 through 11 we discover the name of the builder of the city of Babylon and of this tower. It says there in Genesis chapter 10 and verse 8, Cush begot Nimrod. He began to be a mighty one on the earth. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord. Therefore it is said like Nimrod the mighty hunter before the Lord. And now notice, and the beginning of his kingdom was what? Was Babel. And then several other cities are mentioned as well. And by the way the cities that are mentioned are the worst enemies of Israel in the Old Testament. Now Nimrod was a descendant of Ham and ha the line of Ham was the most wicked line of the three sons of Noah. Of course Shem continued the holy line. Ham brought into existence the kingdom of Babylon, Assyria, also uh, uh, other kingdoms that were inimical to God and inimical to God's people. Now it's interesting to notice that the name Nimrod means rebellion. In Hebrew the name Nimrod means rebellion. And of course this whole enterprise at the Tower of Babel was a rebellious enterprise. Now lest you think that that's not important, over 70 times in the book of Genesis we find God emphasizing the meaning of a name. In Genesis names are not just given to identify people. Names are given in order to describe the character of the bearer of the name. And in Genesis you have God changing names very frequently when the character changes. And so the name Nimrod, rebellion, is very very important. This descendant of Ham who was intent on establishing an apostate religion against God. By the way, later Babylonian tradition said that uh, Nimrod married a woman called Semiramis. And when both of them died, the Babylonian belief came that Nimrod went to the sun and became the sun god, and Semiramis went to the moon and she became the moon goddess. In other words we have this, this apostate idolatry which originated with Nimrod at the Tower of Babel, the intention of the devil to totally demoralize the human race. Now go with me back to Genesis chapter 11 and I'd like to read verses 3 and 4. Genesis 11 verses 3 and 4. It continues saying here, Then they said to one another, Come, let us make bricks and bake them thoroughly. They had brick for stone and they had asphalt for mortar. Now probably some of you have been to Israel and one thing which really strikes you when you go to Israel is the amount of stones that you have there. There seem to be rocks everywhere and most of the ancient edifications were made out of rock. But we're talking here about the valley of Mesopotamia. Uh, we're talking about a place where even today there's not an abundance of rocks. But uh, construction is made with bricks and of course there's a lot of asphalt because of the tremendous amount of oil. Uh, uh, you know the geographical location today would be Iraq. And so this is historically true what is being said here. Now notice verse 4, and they said, come let us build ourselves a city. Notice that word ourselves, this is a selfish enterprise. Let us build ourselves a city and a tower whose top is in the heavens. Let us make a name for ourselves, there it is again lest we be scattered abroad over the face of the whole earth. What didn't they want to happen? They did not want to be what? They did not want to be scattered on the face of the earth. They wanted to consolidate in one great apostate united system against God. You might call this a new world order. It was no longer a patriarchal type of uh, existence where each household basically was independent of the other household. This is the first time that you have a monarchy in human history. Now I want you to notice 
uh, a very interesting statement that I found in the book Patriarchs and Prophets. By the way, this is my favorite uh, book on Old Testament history. It's tremendous. It has incredible insights. It's been given away here in the seminar to several, several people. Allow me to just read you this statement. It's found on page 119 of the book Patriarchs and Prophets. It says this, God had directed men to disperse throughout the earth, to replenish and subdue it. But these Babel builders determined to keep their community united in one body and to found a monarchy that should eventually embrace the whole earth. Monarchy, that means one ruler governing over all the world, basically. It continues saying, thus their city would become the metropolis of a universal empire. Its glory would command the admiration and homage of the world and render the founders illustrious. The magnificent tower reaching to the heavens was intended to stand as a monument of the power and wisdom of its builders, perpetuating their fame to the latest generations. The word ourselves in this verse indicates that this was a selfish enterprise. They wanted to bring glory and honor to themselves. They wanted to establish a universal empire in apostasy against God. In fact, later on in history, over a thousand years later, another Babylonian ruler named Nebuchadnezzar established what is known as the Neo-Babylonian Empire in the same geographical location. And we catch a little bit of the spirit of the original builders by looking at the spirit that Nebuchadnezzar had. Notice Daniel chapter 4 and verse 30. Daniel chapter 4 and verse 30. Here we have Nebuchadnezzar's spirit. It's the same spirit as the Babel builders. It says here, Nebuchadnezzar speaking about his kingdom, the king spoke saying, Is not this great Babylon that I have built for a royal dwelling by my mighty power and for the honor of my majesty? He had the same spirit as the original builders, selfish, wanting to exalt himself. Now you'll notice that they wanted to build the tower to reach onto the heavens. You need to understand this in the light of the flood. The fact is that perhaps they wanted to, ex to build the tower so high that they could explain the reason for the flood, which was scientifically absurd. But even more importantly in their minds, they felt that they needed to build a tower taller than what the waters of the flood had reached so that in case there should be another flood they would be able to climb up on the tower and they would be able to deliver themselves from destruction. In other words they distrusted the word of God. When God said I will not send another flood upon the earth they said let's build a, a tower just in case. It was a project totally built upon selfishness. Now you notice here that they say that they want to make themselves a name. Probably a better translation would be they wanted their reputation to become known. They wanted to become renowned. Now these individuals, the builders of the Tower of Babel, were actually uh, sharing the same spirit as the sons or the daughters of men uh, in Genesis chapter 6. I want you to notice Genesis chapter 6 the giants that came from the relationship between the sons of God and the daughters of men. Genesis chapter 6 and I would like to read verse 2. It says there that the sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were beautiful and they took wives for themselves of all they chose. Who intercrossed here or interbred? The sons of God and whom? And the daughters of men. Now I want you to notice verse 4. The, there were giants, Nephilim is the word, there were giants on the earth in those days. 
and also afterwards so you notice that the giants were not only the result of the relationship between the sons of God and the daughters of men they existed both before and after these giants but now notice the expression it says verse 4 again there were giants on the earth in those days and also afterward when the sons of God came into the daughters of men and they bore children to them now here comes the key portion those were the mighty men who were of old men of what? men of renown it's the identical expression that is used in Genesis 11 let us make a name for ourselves in other words it really says they were men with a name or with a reputation and if you read the very next verse you can see what kind of reputation they had every intent of the imagination of their hearts was only evil continually that's the type of name that they had they were wicked they were renowned for their iniquity by the way the expression sons of men is used for the builders of the Tower of Babel did you notice that sons of men now in Genesis chapter 6 you have sons of God daughters of men here you have sons of men do you think maybe there were daughters of God also have you ever stopped to wonder why the sons of God looked at the daughters of men and they didn't pay any attention to the daughters of God later on in this series I'm going to explain the reason why the daughters of men which are descendants from the lineage of Cain had something attractive that the daughters of God did not have and it had to do with their external appearance now the sons of men here are the male counterpart of the daughters of men of Genesis chapter 6 the daughters of men are the descendants of Cain the women descendants of Cain the sons of men here are the male descendants of whom? of Cain if you read uh, Ecclesiastes chapter 8 and verse 11 it says that because the sentence is not given against the wicked immediately their heart is the heart of the sons of men is set to do evil in other words the expression sons of men in Genesis represents the wicked now we need to take a look at Genesis chapter 11 and verse 5 let's continue our analysis of this passage Genesis chapter 11 and verse 5 it says here but the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the sons of men had built see the expression sons of men represents the wicked the male counterpart of the daughters of men the sons of God are the what? they are the righteous according to what we've studied now notice verse 6 and the Lord said indeed the people are what? what? were they united? in this enterprise? they most certainly were, they were united in rebellion against God indeed the people are one and they all have one language what kept them glued together? the fact that they spoke the same language you see they didn't need to scatter over all of the earth because they all spoke the same language but now notice what God says and this is what they begin to do what God is saying is this is only the beginning of what they intend to do and unless I nip this thing in the bud it is going to totally get out of control the world is going to become totally corrupted and then the holy line will disappear and there will be no Messiah and so it says this is what they begin to do now nothing that they propose to do will be withheld from them basically their master plan was to establish a one world government in alienation from God totally united in iniquity and to erase from the world the memory of God but God knew what they were doing and so God looks and he says they all have one language, they all have one intention, they all have one purpose so I'm going to do something to nip this in the bud before they carry it so far that the knowledge of God disappears from the earth and so in Genesis 11 and verse 7 we find 
what God does. And of course we're all acquainted with this story. It says in verse 7, Come, God is speaking, let us go down and there confuse their language that they may not understand one another's speech. And that's exactly what God did. Now I want you to imagine what this must have been like. They were building this gigantic tower and probably it had reached a height where they had to communicate by levels. In other words one person communicating to another person lower on the tower. And of course they passed along the materials for the building of the tower. And suddenly, by a divine miracle, their languages are confused. In other words, they're given the capacity of speaking probably many of the languages that we have in the world today. And so the one that's at the top level says to the next one, Hey, pass me some bricks. And the one on the lower said, ¿Qué fue lo que dijiste? and then the, he talks to the one below him and he's talking in French and the one below him is speaking in German you can imagine the confusion and the division that came as a result of God doing this in fact they had to quit their enterprise of building the city and building the tower and they scattered over all of the earth we're going to notice that in the next verse they scattered over the whole earth and they formed societies according to the languages which they spoke now why was this God's plan? listen folks it's much less likely that you're going to have a consolidated worldwide universal rebellion against God when you have many nations and many tongues and many peoples a universal rebellion against God is much easier when you have everybody consolidated and gathered together as one to war against the God of heaven. And so God says if I scatter them abroad over the earth this will at least for a long period of time keep them from consolidating one evil civilization to totally erase from the earth the knowledge of God which will mean that the holy line will disappear and the Messiah that I have promised will not come. Notice Genesis chapter 11 and verse 8 on this point. Why God did this. We, it is, it's explained in Genesis 11 and verse 8. It says, so the Lord what? The intention was not only to, to confuse the languages, it was to scatter them. So the Lord scattered them abroad from thence over the face of all the earth. God is saying, listen, listen, if you don't want to scatter, I'll do it for you. And they ceased building the city. And now notice verse 9, critical, critically important. Therefore its name is called what? Babel. Does that have prophetic significance? Does Revelation speak about Babel? It calls it Babylon, yes. And so it says, therefore, its name is called Babel, because there the Lord confused the language of all the earth, and from there the Lord scattered them abroad over the face of all the earth. So now consolidated rebellion against God a universal rebellion against God was made extremely difficult, not impossible because in the, in the end time it's going to happen, but very very difficult before the Messiah should come that the whole world gather together in apostasy against God. Now do you know that every nation of the world branched out from Babel? You know it's interesting, the, the apostate religion of Babel has been exported to every nation in the world. That's why you find common practices among religions that are radically different. You have for example the rosary. Now I don't know what denomination you belong to, but just to give you an example. Do you know that Hindus use beads in their prayers? Did you know that Muslims use beads in their prayers? I saw it myself with my own eyes. Do you know that Buddhists use beads 
or a type of rosary in their prayers as also do Roman Catholics? Now the question is how do you have such radically different religions all having a common practice? The answer is that all of the nations of the world originated at Babel. And the religious practices which the nations have in common, many of them contrary to the Word of God, originated with a common ancestry at the Tower of Babel, including worshiping the sun god Nimrod. That proliferated all throughout Old Testament history. By the way, notice Genesis 10 verse 32 where we are told this. Genesis chapter 10 and verse 32. It says there were families, these excuse me, were the families of the sons of Noah. According to their generations, in their nations, and from these nations were divided on the earth after the flood. All nations were divided on the earth after the flood. So where did all nations come from? All nations came from the experience at the Tower of Babel. Now there's something that I want you to notice which is very significant. Immediately after the Tower of Babel episode is spoken of, it ends in Genesis 11 and verse 9. The very next verse, don't miss this point, the very next verse presents the genealogy of Shem. Now you say, why is that important? For the simple reason that the Babel builders were descendants of whom? Of Ham. They were the ones who built Babylon. The descendants of Shem would eventually be whom? Israel. And so in this early period you have the devil establishing his system known as Babylon and God preparing the world by establishing his people the Shemites. And of course all throughout the Old Testament and into the book of Revelation the final war is between Israel and what? And Babylon. And so in Genesis 11 you have the lines drawn. You have the builder of Babylon, Nimrod, the rebellious one, and then you have the genealogy of Shem from whom Abraham will come and from whom eventually the Messiah will come. So you have the idea of the two seeds already in Genesis 11. Already God working to establish His people and the devil working to establish His people to war against the people of God. Are you understanding what I'm saying? Now it just so happens that living there in the area where the Tower of Babel was built was a man called Abraham. Let's go to the book of Acts chapter 7 and verses 2 through 4. Acts chapter 7 and verses 2 through 4. It speaks about this man Abraham. By the way you have three gene genealogies in uh, the Bible which are of crucial significance. You have the genealogy in Genesis 5 which gives you the lineage uh, from uh, Seth all the way down to Noah. And then you have the genealogy in Genesis 11 which gives you the, the line from Shem the son of Noah all the way down to Abraham. And then in Matthew chapter 1 you have the genealogy from Abraham all the way down to the times of Jesus Christ. In other words God is showing that he was preserving the holy seed even in the midst of rebellion and apostasy even when it looked like the Babel builders were going to demoralize the world in its infancy God says I'm not going to allow it I'm going to scatter them all over the earth. And then from this very region in Genesis 12 1 immediately after the Tower of Babel episode God extends to Abraham a call. Now notice Acts chapter 7 and verse 2. And he said, Stephen is speaking here, Brethren and fathers listen, the God of glory appeared unto our father Abraham when he was in Mesopotamia before he dwelt in Haran. Do you know what the word Mesopotamia means? It means the land between two rivers. And the two rivers are the Euphrates and the Tigris. So where did, where did he live? Where did Abraham live? 
he lived in Babylon that's right now notice verse 3 and said to him, what does God say to Abraham? Get out of your country and from your relatives and come to a land that I will show you. What land is that? The land of what? Canaan. What was in Canaan? Bethlehem. What was in Canaan? Canaan? Jerusalem. Who would come to Bethlehem and Jerusalem? The Messiah. So God calls Abraham, he says, come out of Babylon and I will take you to Canaan. Notice verse 4. Then he came out of the land of the what? See there's another instance where it shows that this is Babylon. Came out of the land of the Chaldeans and dwelt in Haran and from there when his father was dead he moved him to this land in which you now dwell. So God calls Abraham out of Babylon and he takes him to Canaan to the promised land. And God promises he's going to establish a nation from him. And unfortunately Christians have missed the point. They focus on the nation instead of the reason why God called the nation. You see God did not call Israel simply because he preferred Israel. He called Israel because by preserving this people with the truth and with the holy line eventually from this people established in Canaan in Jerusalem the Messiah would come to the world. In other words the center of choosing Israel was not Israel it was Israel's Messiah. Are you understanding what I'm saying? Now why did God take Abraham out of Babylon to Canaan? Notice what we find in Joshua chapter 24 and verses 2 and 3. Joshua chapter 24 and verses 2 and 3. And it clearly explains the reason why God took him out. It says there, beginning in verse 2, And Joshua said to all the people, Thus says the Lord God of Israel, Your fathers, including Terah, the father of Abraham, and the father of Nahor, dwelt on the other side of the river, what river is that? When the Bible speaks of the river it's the Euphrates, in all time. And what, then what does it say? And they served other gods. What was happening with the lineage of Abraham? It was becoming corrupted by other gods and idolatry. Whose agenda was this? Satan. Did Satan know that Abraham was a member of the Holy Line? He certainly, why would he want to corrupt them with other gods? What is the devil's battle cry? To prevent the seed from coming because the seed is going to crush his head. Are you understanding this? See there's more than meets the eye here. God didn't call Abraham to come out of, out of Babylon to go to Canaan because God wanted to have a favorite people Israel. The purpose of Israel was to proclaim the message of the coming Messiah to the world so that when the Messiah would come the world would be ready to receive him. You're not with me tonight. So it says in verse 3, Then I took your father Abraham from the other side of the river, that is from the Euphrates, led him throughout all the land of what? Canaan and multiplied his descendants it says here actually it's seed and gave him whom? and gave him Isaac. Now notice Genesis chapter 12 and verses 1 to 3. Genesis chapter 12 and verses 1 through 3. By the way what we're discussing in our lecture today is critical for understanding Bible prophecy. You need to remember what we're studying because most Bible prophecy today that is taught centers on Israel. But it misses the point because prophecy does not center on Israel. Prophecy central cent centers on Israel's Messiah. The prophecies of the Old Testament are messianic. Jesus said if you believe Moses you would believe me because Rose Moses wrote about me. Beginning at Moses and all of the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Now notice Genesis chapter 12 and verses 1 through 3. Now the Lord had said to Abram, get out of your country. See God called him out from your family and from your father's house to a land that I will show you. I will make you a great nation. 
I will bless you and make your name great and you shall, now notice, I will bless you and then he says you will be a what? God blesses him so that he can become a blessing it says I will bless those who bless you and I will curse him who curses you and in you all the Jews of the earth shall be blessed no it says all the what? all the families of the earth shall be blessed now if you read through Genesis you'll discover that time and again it not only says that in you all of the nations of the earth will be blessed it says in your seed all the nations of the earth would be blessed the only reason why God says that they were going to be blessed through Abraham is because from Abraham came whom? from Abraham came the Messiah now it's interesting to notice that God chooses Abraham an individual from that individual he forms a huge nation and that nation is to focus on preparing the world for the coming of whom? of an individual it begins with an individual spreads to a people to bring the message about Messiah to the world and then brings attention to an individual at the end and then we're going to notice that that individual who is Jesus then calls a people on the day of Pentecost to proclaim the message of the Messiah to the whole world in other words the plan begins with an individual goes to a nation to prepare the world for the coming of the Messiah the Messiah the individual comes and then when Jesus comes he calls a people just like he called the Jewish nation to proliferate his message to the whole world about the Messiah who has come. The only difference between Israel and the Old Testament and the church is that Israel in the Old Testament was to prepare the world for the coming Messiah the church is supposed to proclaim the world to the world the Messiah who has come now this is exciting isn't it? now notice Galatians chapter 3 and verse 16 lest you are wondering whether I'm on target or not notice Galatians chapter 3 and verse 16 the scriptures tell, tell us this very clearly it says there in verse 16 now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made to whom were the promises made? to Abraham and his what? and his seed and now notice he does not say and to seeds as of many but as of one and to your seed who is Christ to whom were the promises made? the promises made were made to Abraham and his seed and who is the seed of Abraham? Christ who is at the very center of the call of Abraham? it is Jesus Christ by the way do you know that in 2 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 20 it says that all of the promises of God are yes and amen in Jesus Christ by the way do you know that God made four basic promises to Abraham? you have them on your list we don't have time to read them we'll come back to them by the way in our next lecture where we'll deal more specifically with Abraham and the covenant promises God first of all promised him the blessing that from him would come the blessing that's in uh, Genesis 12 verse 3 secondly he promised him the land the blessing the land and some people say he promised him the land of Canaan listen folks Abraham knew that God was promising him much more than the land of Canaan it says in uh, Romans chapter 4 and verse 13 that Abraham knew that God had promised him that he would be the heir of the world and in Hebrews 11 it says that Abraham looked for a city a heavenly city whose builder and maker is God he knew that the center of the promises was not old Jerusalem but new Jerusalem in other words God promised him not only that little stretch of land over there known as, as Israel he promised him the whole world of which that land was a down payment so he promised him the blessing he promised him the land by the way he promised him that he would have dominion over his enemies he would regain kingship in other words and he also promised him that he would have a seed through whom all of the nations of the earth would be blessed four basic promises the blessing the land dominion and the seed 
Now allow me to share with you some very interesting information. You know, people ask, did the heroes of the Old Testament really understand that all of this was pointing to the Messiah, that they were called only with the intention of bringing the Messiah, the knowledge of the Messiah to the world? I'm going to share some information with you. I'm not going to read it right now because we don't have the time to read it, but you have it on your list of texts. It's also in the copy of the lecture. I hope that you'll go through that copy of the lecture. But there's an expression that is used all throughout the Bible, and it's the expression to call upon the name of the Lord. To call upon the name of the Lord. First time that this is used is in Genesis 4 verse 26, where it says that Seth called upon the name of the Lord. Then you find in Genesis chapter 12 and verse 8 that Abraham called upon the name of the Lord. You find in Genesis chapter 26 and verse 25 that Isaac called upon the name of the Lord. In 1 Kings 18, 36 and 37 it says that Elijah called upon the name of the Lord. Do you know that each time they call upon the name of the Lord there's a common denominator? They raise an altar, they offer a sacrifice, and then they call upon the name of the Lord. What did those sacrifices represent when they called upon the name of the Lord? They represented whom? Jesus. And does anyone, anybody doubt this? In Acts chapter 2 and verse 21, Peter on the day of Pentecost is preaching this tremendous sermon. And Peter quotes this phrase from the Old Testament, call upon the name of the Lord, and he says that everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And who is the Lord in that text? It is Jesus. So upon whom did Seth, Abraham, Isaac, Elijah, and all of the Old Testament heroes call? They called upon the name of Jesus. By the way, the Apostle Paul also in Romans chapter 10 verses 11 to 13 speaks about calling upon the name of the Lord Jesus in order to be saved. So all of these Old Testament heroes understood, very clearly understood, that the sacrifice is representing the, represented the coming of the Messiah who was going to die for the sins of the world. Incidentally, we're explicitly told in John chapter 8 and verse 56 as Jesus is speaking with the Jewish leaders he says Abraham what? Abraham saw my day and what? and was glad and rejoiced did Abraham understand Christ's day? Did he understand that all of these promises were to be fulfilled in and through the Messiah? The Bible says yes. So Abraham understood that Israel was not at the center, Jesus was at the center. Calling upon the name of the Lord, upon offering a sacrifice, represents the fact that Jesus dies for our sins and we call upon his name to receive forgiveness for our sins. That was at the very center of the lineage of those who were faithful to God. By the way, the New Testament makes it very clear that Jesus is the one who brings the blessing of Abraham. Let's read Galatians chapter 3 and verses 13 and 14. It could not be any more explicit than this. Galatians chapter 3 and verses 13 and 14. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law having become a curse for us for it is written cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree there you have the sacrifice of Christ right? now notice verse 14 that he did this so that the blessing of Abraham might come upon the Gentiles in Christ Jesus that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith Jesus took the curse upon him so that the blessing of Abraham could come upon everyone who what? who believes in Jesus. All of these prophecies were messianic. And so you have in the Old Testament the devil doing his utmost to keep the seed from coming. He knows that God is choosing Abraham and so he corrupts 
the holy line, even Terah, the father of Abraham. God says, I'm going to take you out of there, and I'm going to bring you to the land of Canaan to preserve pure the faith, and to prepare Canaan for the coming of the Messiah where he will be born, and where the Holy Spirit will be poured out. And so God takes Abraham out. Are you understanding what's happening here? By the way, the Tower of Babel made things a lot more difficult too. It made it impossible for rebellion to consolidate, but it also made it very difficult to proclaim the gospel. Because now you could proclaim the gospel in one language, you had to proclaim the gospel in what? In a multiplicity of languages. The question is, how could you do it? This is where the Lord intervened. Notice Acts chapter 1 and verse 8. Acts chapter 1 and verse 8. Do you know that God undid the curse of Babel by giving a gift to the church? Acts chapter 1 and verse 8. Here Jesus is speaking to his disciples. He says, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the what? to the end of the earth. Now they're going to witness about the Messiah to the whole world. But there's a problem. At Babel all of the languages were, languages were confused. How could these fishermen who spoke Aramaic proclaim the message to the whole world where the languages were confused? What did God give on the day of Pentecost? By the way, do you know that there were 13 nations on the day of Pentecost gathered there to whom the disciples were preaching to? You can read it in Acts chapter 2. There were 13 nations mentioned by name, each with its, with its own language. And suddenly God gave the apostles the capacity to speak instantaneously and perfect, perfectly the languages of those peoples. In other words, what God did at Babel confused the languages, scattered people into different nations so that evil could not consolidate, so that the Messiah could come, which complicated the preaching of the gospel. Now on Pentecost God says the seed has already come, He's done what He needs to do, and so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to bridge the gap. I'm going to give the gift of tongues so that my followers can preach the gospel to the uttermost ends of the earth in the languages of all of the nations. Wow! You see how God is working here? It's amazing how God is, is weaving a pattern here very clearly. And now he calls a people to take his message to the whole world. The message of Jesus who has come. In contrast to the Old Testament, the Jews were chosen to preach the Messiah who would come. But it's the same Messiah. Now we must go in the few minutes that we have left to the end time. Do you know that the book of Revelation tells us that at the end of time there is going to be a gigantic consolidation and unification of the world of one great apostate system against God. I'm going to go through the details very quickly. I wish we had the time to read all of the texts, but I'm just going to paint the picture for you. We're going to be studying these things in much more detail as we go along in this seminar. We're going to talk about the beast, the image to the beast. We're going to talk about the dragon. We're going to talk about the battle of Armageddon. We're going to talk about uh, the millennium. We're going to deal with all of these issues piece by piece. But what I want you to see now is, is the global picture of what Revelation portrays is going to happen. You're going to have once again the same experience as the time or Babel, only it's not going to be in one geographical location, it is going to be a whole world united in rebellion against God. In spite of all of the languages. One gigantic worldwide economic system, political system, national system. It's going to be amazing with the intention of uniting the world in rebellion against God. Let me portray the picture for you. Revelation 17 and verse 5, don't even bother to look for the text, they're in your list and they're in the lecture. All of this is explained in the copy of the lecture. I hope that you'll take the time to study it. It's very important. 
Revelation 17 and verse 5 says that the final power which will rule the world is called Babylon. And it says in Revelation chapter 17 and verse 1 that Babylon sits upon many waters. In Revelation 16 verse 12 it says that the many waters are the Euphrates. Any relationship between Genesis 11 and Revelation 17? You have this harlot, represents an apostate religious system. She's seated, which means that she, gover she governs upon the waters of the Euphrates. But it's not the literal Euphrates, because the angel explains that the waters represents multitudes, nations, tongues, and peoples. In other words, she's ruling over all of these nations that came from what happened at the Tower of Babel. She sits upon the Euphrates and she gives her wine to all of the nations of the world. Revelation 18 verses 2 and 3. The wine represents her apostate false religious teachings that makes the nations drunk with her wine. Now do you suppose that God is going to have a people who are going to warn against this worldwide apostate system? It's no coincidence folks that it says that the harlot sits upon many waters and it interprets the waters in Revelation 17 verse 15 as multitudes, nations, tongues and peoples. Revelation 14 verses 6 through 12 warns against this system by saying that God sends three messages by three angels and these messages are to go to every nation, kindred, tongue and people. The very words that are used to describe where the harlot sits. So is God going to have two groups at the end of time? Just, at the, at, just like at the Tower of Babel. He most certainly is. He's going to have one group like the descendants of Shem who are faithful to God who preserve the holy line of Messiah spiritually speaking and then there's going to be the Babel builders who are in apostasy against God. Are you understanding me or not? Tremendous! And, and those who are building Babylon, this harlot, and the kings of the earth, and it says in Revelation 18, the merchants of the earth are all working together. It says in Revelation chapter 17 that they will all have one mind. Did they have that at Babel? Yes, they will have one mind in apostasy against God. And you'll have the same experience that took place in the days of Daniel when Nebuchadnezzar raised an image in honor of himself and he commanded everyone to worship and whoever did not worship was to be killed. Remember that that happened in Babylon where the Tower of Babel was built. Revelation 13 picks up on that and it speaks about an image which is built by the beast and the beast commands everyone to worship his image and whoever does not worship the image will be killed. You see it's picking up on what happened in ancient Babylon only in the end time it's not going to be a literal image we're going to study. It represents a worldwide system in apostasy against God. So God raises up a people to preach to those upon whom this apostate religious system sits and God actually calls his people to come out just like, just like he did with Abraham. Notice Revelation chapter 18. So interesting, so many things to discuss and so little time to discuss them. Notice chapter 18 and verses 4 and 5 of Revelation. It says, And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people. Is God going to call a people out of Babylon in the end time? Yes? By the way, do you know that Babylon has three parts? Revelation 16, 13 says that Babylon has three parts. It's the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet. And we're going to have a whole lecture on each one of them in this series because we need to know who they are. It's a triple coalition which unites the whole world in rebellion against God. And God says, come out of her my people lest you share in her sins and lest you receive her what? Her plagues. For her sins have reached to heaven and God has remembered 
her iniquities. And by the way, like the Tower of Babel came crush, crashing down, end time Babylon will also come crashing down. Notice our final passage, Revelation chapter 16. We better not be in Babylon if it's going to come crashing down. We better make sure that we accept God's call to come out. Notice Revelation chapter 16 and beginning with verse 17, the seventh plague, the culmination of this whole end time scenario. It says, Then the seventh angel poured out his bowl into the air, and a loud voice came out of the temple of heaven from the throne saying, It is done! and there were noises and thunderings and lightnings and there was a great earthquake such a mighty and great earthquake as has not occurred since men were on the earth now the great city was divided into three parts see now the city that was united is what? is divided into three parts and the cities of the nations fell and great Babylon was remembered before God to give her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath then every island fled away, and the mountains were not found, and great hail from heaven fell upon men. Each hailstone about the weight of a talent, that's about 50 pounds. Men blasphemed God because of the plague of the hail, since the plague was exceeding great. Babylon will fall, just like at the beginning. And then God will take His people home, where they will live with Him forever. Folks, we better be absolutely sure that we are not in Babylon. Let's be on God's side.